The following episode contains graphic content that might not be suitable for all listeners. Some emergencies are apparent in an instant. A bone is broken, a person is unconscious, a storm is raging overhead. In those situations, we know that we need to find help and fast. But when dangerous events unravel slowly, that urgency might be lacking. You're sure just 10 minutes ago you were on the trail, so it can't be that far and you keep walking. Your hiking partner is acting strange, but it might be the altitude or exhaustion. These events can seem like obvious foreshadowing in retrospect, but when you're in the moment, they're a lot trickier in real time. The danger, of course, is that what started out as an innocuous assumption that you can still get things back on track can cascade until you find yourself in a situation that feels completely out of your control. Today's story is about one of those cascades. In this tale, our guest made a handful of mistakes, mistakes that might seem like obvious missteps to listeners at home, but that just illustrates just how difficult it is to make sound decisions when you're cold, hungry, and fearful for your life. It's one of the weirdest things about backcountry survival. Precisely when you need sound judgment the most, The conditions in your brain conspire to cloud that judgment. It might be easy to make the right call from the comfort of your home, but survival decisions don't tend to arise when you're well-rested and well-fed. They didn't for today's guest, but in the end, his determination and ingenuity saved his life. I made a decision to survive. You're in that survival mode. The the idea of dying wasn't in my head. I knew immediately it was the worst case scenario. I was in a fight for my life situation. Whenever you walk out on these trails, you're in their house. I'm Louisa Albanese, and you're listening to Out Alive by Backpacker. In each episode of this podcast, we'll bring you real stories of real people who survived the unsurvivable. I saw the rope zip through the rappel ring, and I couldn't do anything. Learn what went wrong, what went right, and how you can escape if the worst case scenario happens to you. There is no way we would find anybody alive. I'm 33 years old. I used to be in the military. This is Rob, only his name is not actually Rob. The names in this story have been changed to protect the identity of our storyteller. I was stationed in Anchorage, Alaska, and I had a truck that I was in the process of selling, and I put it on the market. An outfitter reached out to me and said, hey, I'd love to buy the truck, and then I'll give you a reduced price, but then I'll give you a trip for two people to go and hunt trophy bull caribou way up north. And I said, okay, that sounds, let's do that. That sounds great. I've been hunting with my family probably since I was six years old. So I've been hunting for quite a while at this point. We were super excited about it. We've hunted a lot of other game across the U.S. and in Alaska, black bear hunting, just a lot of different things. So we felt really confident about the trip. It was late August and the trip was supposed to be six nights and seven days. The outfitter would drop Rob and his friend off by bush plane with all of their gear and then return on the seventh day to pick them up. My friend and I, we drove up the roughly 18 hours north, up through Anchorage and up the Hall Road. And so we were about 50 miles shy of Dead Horse. Before we actually went to his camp, we went up to Dead Horse and kind of checked out the whole place there. Uh, Not a lot to see, it's pretty barren. We met with him and hopped in the plane. And then we flew 11 miles over to the east where he dropped us off on his float plane. Located on Alaska's northern shore near the Arctic Ocean, the unincorporated community of Dead Horse and the surrounding area are remote. Any infrastructure exists mainly to support nearby oiling operations with the occasional hunting outfitter. One of the northernmost communities in the U.S., Dead Horse sits above the Arctic Circle, where the sun doesn't set all summer, and even in August, temperatures rarely break 50 degrees. Herds of caribou and musk oxen are commonly found on the open tundra, as well as the occasional grizzly and polar bear. We set up camp there that night. We had put a little 
white flag outside of our tent because some people say that it can attract caribou. So we'd never hunted caribou before. So I was like, hey, let's try that. So we woke up the next morning and unzipped the tent. And sure enough, we look over and there's a really nice caribou about 300 yards away. So we're like, well, hey, let's try to get that one. 300 yards isn't a crazy far distance to shoot. We're used to shooting in the flatlands pretty far, but there was a lot of vegetation in the way. So we're like, you know what? Let's get closer and get a better shot on this thing and stuff like that. So we threw on some rain gear. I grabbed my rifle, my pistol, and then I had binoculars. And then my friend brought his pistol and his binoculars as well. And so we just throw on some quick rain gear and stuff and then go ahead and try to walk to closer towards the caribou, sneak up on it. We only planned on walking 150 yards from the tent. That's really not a big deal. It kind of moved around a little bit. So I go ahead and I tried to shoot it and it just picked its head up and looked around and then went back to feeding. And so I was like, what on earth is wrong with my gun? And so I shot again and, uh, and I totally missed again. And I looked down at my gun and I'm just frustrated and I kind of jerked my gun down and look at it and I watched my whole scope just turn in its rings. And for people that don't know what that means, basically your gun is completely useless. The scope is no longer functioning whatsoever. And it was a really great start to a seven day hunting trip. It just meanders off, goes over a hill. We go over the hill to look and make sure that it's safe. And it was totally fine. It didn't have any wounds or anything. We see another herd that's probably about 800 yards away that my friend was like, hey, I'm gonna just go and try to sneak up on one of these and shoot those. And I said, okay, sounds good. I'm gonna sit here and contemplate life <laughs> now that my gun is completely useless. Kind of watched him go over there and I watched the herd kind of stir and the wind's picking up pretty good at this point. I'm just watching him through my binoculars and he flags me down. And so I go over there and he's like, hey man, I set down my binoculars. Can you help me find them? And uh, one of the best ways to get lost is to stare at the ground and walk around in circles. And so that's what we did, looking for these binoculars. <laughs> and we look for a while and can't really seem to find them anywhere. So you know what, let's just go back for breakfast and then we'll just get set up properly. We proceed to head back to the tent and the fog is starting to move in pretty good. And we're like, well, let's, yeah, let's hurry back to the tent. We, uh, we kind of look around and look around and, you know, in hindsight, everybody knows that you should just stay put until the weather clears so that you can just get your bearings a little bit better when the fog lifts. We really felt that we had never walked really that far away from the tent, probably no more than 500 yards, and it's just a rolling landscape. While humans like to think we have a decent sense of direction, we're actually pretty bad at finding our way without the help of landmarks. When there's no visibility, people have difficulty judging straight ahead and a tendency to walk in circles instead of straight lines. This is why it's best to stay put if you find yourself lost. For probably the first couple hours, it was really maddening just because it's like, it's right here. This is so ridiculous. I just want to get back and just get the stuff set up and just get ready for the day and just go do this trip. We have a chance to hunt for two trophy bull caribou for each of us. It was just gonna be super awesome trip, really a trip of a lifetime for us. So it was really frustrating that we couldn't get started. The two hunters searched until they became exhausted and the realization that they were lost settled in. They hoped that the fog would break the next day and that they would find their way after they got some rest. Then we found a cut bank along the side of a dry riverbed. And so we slept in there and just shivered our way through the night, trying to sleep there. That was fairly worrisome, just trying to figure out there is a lot of miles that we could get lost in up here. On Alaska's northern slope, towns are few and far between, with millions of acres of tundra between human populations. Where communities do exist, infrastructure is sparse. While Dead Horse sat somewhere 11 miles away, if Rob and his friend wandered in the wrong direction, they could search for weeks and never see civilization again. And the farther we go from the tent, the longer it's gonna take for them to find us. I found out that I make a way better little spoon because my teeth chatter too loud, I'm told. <laughs> and so anyway, so we just went back and forth with that and kind of tried to stay warm throughout the night and uh, woke up the next morning. It was probably that second day where we were just like, man, this is such a vast area that if we do keep walking, we could just end up in the middle of nowhere and just never, ever be found. Probably several hours where we're like, we should just sit here. But then it's like, how far have we already walked from the tent and how long is it before they're gonna find us? And then it's like, well, the tent can't be that far away. Fog was pretty heavy still but we had probably visibility of about 200 yards or so and we would walk to the edge of the fog line without ever, ever losing sight of each other and then just really just trying to find our bright orange tent like it really shouldn't be that hard to find because back at our tent i mean we have 
GPS is we have sat phone, we have five different kinds of water purifiers, just because we wanted to try different ones that we hadn't tried before. We had two weeks worth of food, just it was completely all the stuff and we never found it again, ever. Exasperated, the hunters gave up hope of finding their tent and turned their attention instead to finding their way out of the vast and unforgiving landscape surrounding them. They knew the outfitter's cabin was a relatively straight shot 11 miles west from where they started, so they decided to try and make it back to the outfitter for help. And so we're just, we get to the point where we're just taking a break and just kind of sitting there and pretty hungry at this point, pretty thirsty. There's water everywhere. There's little puddles and big ponds and stuff like that, but there's also little white swimming things, and we figured that was probably a really efficient way to get dehydrated, so we just kind of stayed away from that water for the time being. While it's true that contaminated water can make you sick, survival experts recommend drinking any water you can find if you're in trouble. Dehydration can be fatal in just a few days. Waterborne illnesses can take weeks to settle in. The immediate reward of fending off dehydration is usually worth the risk of illness later on. We're just kind of sitting there and looking around and then my buddy points over and he's like, hey, look, check out that, that rainbow over there. I was like, it's not a rainbow, that's really interesting. It's shaped like a big arch, like a rainbow, but, but there was no color in it. It was just, a, it was like a cloud, just this really solid cloud. I was like, that is so weird, but I don't think that's a rainbow. And we didn't have a lot else going on at the time, so we decided to go over and check it out. We can't be exactly sure what Rob and his friends saw that day, but there are several meteorological explanations for what they saw. Both sun dogs and sun pillars are refractions and reflections of the sun's light that occur when ice crystals in the air are present and the sun is low on the horizon. And I was like, hey, do you think we should? And he's like, yeah, I think we should. And for whatever reason we concluded, we decided to follow this thing. It's worth saying that following any type of unknown natural phenomenon is unlikely to lead you to salvation when you're lost in the backcountry. In fact, it's likely to get you more lost. But cold and disoriented, Rob and his friend's judgment was compromised by their circumstances. Man, this kind of reminds me of a story that I listened to a long time ago. The Bible story of the Israelites when they actually followed this cloud pillar, which I just thought that was... I don't know, it was just really, the whole thing was really weird. And just, <laughs> but I just felt like we should follow it. We just felt like this thing would just take us west, which is pretty much what we needed to do is we figured in theory, it should loosely speak and be a pretty straight shot back to the outfitter's cabin. The terrain that Rob and his friend would have to navigate back to the outfitter was primarily made up of tundra and muskeg. Muskeg is a colloquial term for a peat bog. They're dense wetlands that form in areas with high rainfall and poor drainage. Some muskegs can be deceptively deep and are filled with thick organic matter. Animals and hikers have drowned in muskeg after becoming stuck in the sediment, unable to make their way back through the vegetation covered surface. Just having to walk around a bunch of ponds, we came across a creek that we walked up and down as far as we could without just thinking it was ridiculous and there's just no end to it. And it was probably about 10 feet wide. And so we eventually had to strip down and swim across. There's still definitely wind and it's foggy and just very cold. So once we got out of the creek and put our clothes back on, it was just really cold. You can't really dry off super well. And so that kind of made our socks fairly damp and that made the insoles of our boots wet and they stayed wet for the rest of the trip. Even though it was summer, the temperature still hovered around freezing. We keep walking and we walk and there's like a, across a lot of these lakes, the vegetation pretty much grows across the entire face of the lake. And we didn't really know that at the time. And so you're just walking across what you think is tundra. And then all of a sudden you'll just see this ripple across the ground and then you'll punch through. And so I punched through one time. That was pretty frustrating. I went up to my armpits and then my friend kind of spider webbed his way out on top of the vegetation and, and pulled me out. I would hate to go all the way down through one of those because I would imagine that the sediment and the weeds are pretty thick and it would be pretty difficult to s swim back out of. And at that point, I'm really wet. Rob and his friend followed the sun dog for the better part of the day. With no other plan or landmarks, they used the cloud to maintain their bearings, hoping they were heading west. And then it started to dissipate and it probably went away in probably the course of 20, 30 minutes. And uh, sure enough, when the sun came out, we're like, wow, this is really great because the sun was pretty hard on our left. And so when you're that far up, the sun <laughs> doesn't go above you, it goes around you. 
we had it predominantly on our left. We felt really confident that we were heading pretty much perfectly west this entire time. And that just totally felt like a God thing that he gave us that pillar that we followed. We just tried to keep the sun mostly on our left. After a while, we saw this little tiny silver flash of something. And uh, so we looked through my binoculars since we never found his again. And uh, we're like, oh, hey, that's the pump station or a pump station. And we just knew that the silver speck was a sign of humans. And so we started walking towards that. And we walked for quite a while longer. And at that point, there was a plane that flew overhead, probably like 300 feet. And uh, he jumped up and down and waved our arms at him. And he waved back, just like any other <laughs> bush pilot would to what he thinks are just hunters that are just being friendly that morning. And after we realized that we were just hidden in plain sight, that was a bit unnerving because no one realized that we were in distress. We just were like, let's just head for that silver speck. And it seems like it's roughly in the right direction that we wanted. Rob knew the pump stations they were seeing were part of the Trans-Alaskan Pipeline, which runs adjacent to the same haul road the Outfitters Cabin was located on. This was confirmation that they were heading in the right direction. And so we're following that, and then we, as we're going along, we start to see these little red berries. Friends like, do you think we should try these? And I was like, no, that sounds like a terrible idea. <laughs> right, red berries, just seems like it wouldn't be that great for you. Eventually he eats one, and he's like, yeah, I'm just gonna try one. And he, it didn't seem to bother him at all. And we hike for probably another half hour. And then he just really starts to eat these things. There are over 50 varieties of edible berries in Alaska, but there are poison varieties too, like the baneberry, which is very bitter and can cause cardiac arrest. If you find yourself in a survival situation, humans can survive up to three weeks without food. So you should be extremely cautious before consuming any unidentified vegetation. He's like, they're great, they're just fine. And so I was like, man, this is crazy. And so probably another two hours go by as we're just still walking towards this speck. And it was a small silver speck. It was very small. The sun just happened to catch it just right for a while. There was times when the clouds would come in place. We couldn't see the silver speck, but we just tried to look at other brush to help us keep our bearing. You know, there were definitely long periods where we just were just walking. We would figure out what direction we were going and we just walk for a long time. After we found that cloud, we definitely talked about our faith, talked about God, just talked about what was important to us and things like that, because we did talk also about how bleak the situation could get the farther we get away from our tent, because we're just in a such vast area and there are just countless miles up there of tundra that they could be looking for us in. For those of us who live in the lower 48, it can be easy to forget just how massive Alaska is. The state's missing persons rate roughly doubles the national average. When there's that much open land, it's easy to disappear. And then at a different point, it would be like, all right, favorite foods. <laughs> and then it went from favorite foods to last meal. And it went from last meal to when we get rescued, what is the first meal that we are having as soon as we get back to civilization? <laughs> Which is horrible, but that actually was each buying a box of 12 soft shell tacos from Taco Bell. So we just kept walking and walking and eventually I tried to throw one of the berries in my mouth. Like I split it in half with my teeth and put it behind my lip to see if it would like tingle or whatever. Just any roughly speaking poisonous berry if you could remember ever reading about like to see if it was poisonous or not. And it tingled like crazy. So I was like, oh, this is terrible. We're totally gonna get poisoned by these berries. Nothing ever happened to those. I think I ended up eating too, but I just, I didn't really want to risk it. As the sun began to dip, the pump station came more clearly into view and their spirits rose. We're like, man, this is awesome. We start really just really diligently making our way towards it. And then all of a sudden we hit the river and it was awesome. We knew we had made it at that point because the thing that separated the outfitters cabin from our side of the land where we were hunting is the sag. River. After two full days of wandering, the hunters had finally made it to a landmark they recognized. They imagined they'd be headed home soon, warm and dry, with a box of tacos. Just knew that we just needed to walk up along the river and we'd eventually find his trailer and we'd be good to go. When we first got to that river, we were so thankful to finally be there and the water seemed like it was rushing fast enough. We just drank up as much as we could. We just created these little offshoot pools so there wasn't so much silt going into it, but we just drank up that water like crazy because it had been quite a long time since we had drank any water at that point. We started walking up the river and we could see the little Alaskan flag and little American flag. And 
We're like, okay, awesome. That's his trailer. So we get to where we're directly across the river from him. But it's still like probably 200 yards, maybe a little bit less between us and his cabin because the river's braided quite a bit. My friend's like, all right, dude, let's just swim across. But Rob hesitated, remembering a story his friend had told him about a pair of collegiate swimmers who had tried to cross the sag and drowned. The sag originates from the Brooks Mountain Range and flows into the Beaufort Sea. Even in summer, the water temperature can be as low as 40 degrees Fahrenheit, making it potentially deadly to swim across. And search and rescue only found one body. And so I guess the river's just so cold that it just shunts all of your blood flow. And so I knew I wasn't a collegiate swimmer <laughs> for one. And so we're just like, we should probably just be on this side, try to get their attention and have them come over and rescue us. Just fly across the river and just land in one of the hundreds of ponds on our side. We just kind of waited until we saw him come out of the trailer with our binoculars. And then I fired off three shots with my pistol to just try to signal him. Yeah, he didn't give any indication that he heard anything. We're like, he's probably just deaf. So hopefully one of the guys that worked with him has a little better hearing. And over the course of the next few hours, the two other guys came out at different times. We fired off three shots with each of those. Luckily, I had a Glock and it holds 15. And uh, none of them made any indication that they heard us at all. There was no way for us to be able to get a hold of them. We didn't have any way of trying to start a fire. We tried doing a bowstring thing with the hoodie, the string from my hoodie, and that really didn't do much. There was a lot of damp wood, not really any way to get a spark. We tried using the binoculars to try to get some sunlight through those, and there's a protective coating on them, turns out, so that you don't leave them in the dash of your truck and burn it to the ground, I guess. So we're just like, man, what should we do? We're wearing camouflage. We didn't have any orange or anything like that. We didn't have any of our signal mirrors. We didn't have any way of signaling people. We had our camouflage pattern rain gear on, so we blended in really well with the surrounding. And so we didn't, we couldn't take it off because we would have just had gotten hypothermia. And so we, we were right along the riverbank there. And so we took a bunch of rocks and brush and stuff and made a probably about a six foot by eight foot SOS on the side of the bank, just these nice round, perfect letters, which we found out later were actually a terrible idea. You wanna actually make the letters very blocky, be able to clearly stand out from nature, I guess, <laughs> for future reference. We just made a little makeshift shelter in some bushes alongside there and fell asleep for the night. So we spent the night there, we woke up the next morning, we're just figuring out, man, what are we gonna do to be able to get seen, get rescued? Feeling that they'd exhausted their options in trying to signal the outfitter, the hunters decided on another plan. They'd walk along the river towards the town of Dead Horse. They knew it was 50 miles to true civilization, but that there was some cell signal outside of town. With a day or maybe two of walking, they'd be able to call for help. We'll be right back. The outfitter's cabin was like 50 yards from the road, from the hall road. We could see cars going up and down it throughout the entire day, semis and motorcycle riders and things like that. It was a really weird feeling being lost so close to everyone. Like everyone was going about their lives and yet you're just completely stranded and it messes with your head a little bit after a point. Throughout the, those past couple days, we had probably had four or five planes that flew over us just bush planes looking for game to hunt. And every time they would just wave back or they would just not notice us at all, whatever the case was. So we were trying to think, even if, they're, if, even if they do find us and they're flying right over us, they still might not see us. And if they're working a grid and they know they already flew over this area and didn't see us, they're probably not gonna come back to this spot. And so that's what also another thing that caused us to continue to just walk so that we would walk into a new grid area. And so it was all just complete guesswork. We had no idea. We were just trying to do what we could. We decided to pack up <laughs> all of our stuff that was on our back. We just started making our way headed north to Dead Horse. We get about, probably about 15 miles north. It's funny because we can actually just read the road markers next to us because we can see them clearly on, on the roadway there. We saw this big hill, so we peeled off back to the east a little bit to see what we could see. And then sure enough, the river cut away from the Hall Road and it dumped out into the ocean before it would have ever gotten us close enough to be able to get to the to Dead Horse signal range. We just slept there through the night and woke up and pretty hungry, really hungry at that point. We hadn't seen any berries since that, I guess, second day that we were walking around. We were just 
praying about it and just being like, God, you really could use something to eat. Rob and his friend had now been lost and wandering countless miles over rough terrain for four days. Our insoles just still had not dried out the entire time, and so we try to wring them out, and when the sun would come out, we'd pull them out and try to set them on logs to try to dry them out a little bit, but it just, they never got dry, and so our feet were starting to get in pretty rough shape at this point. The, the skin was starting to separate, and there was just a pink film, and uh, they were, yeah, just kind of rough shape. It really didn't feel that great. Having exhausted all other options, the two decided they had no choice but to return to their post across from the outfitter and hope they could get their attention by another means. We start to wake our mate back down, and then we actually find a muskox. And man, at this point, we hadn't eaten in several days, and we were just incredibly hungry, and we had walked a really long distance at this point. We're not really sure exactly how far, but we know that it was 11 miles for the outfitter to fly us straight out to our campsite. And so we definitely had some pretty exaggerated zigzags back and forth to get back to the, to the outfitter's cabin from where we were at. Yeah, we were pretty tired, pretty wore out. What happens next is the result of another lapse in judgment caused by the desperation of Rob and his friend's situation. While a person can survive weeks without food, extreme hunger can lead one to making rash decisions. We just felt like this muskox was provided to us. That was not something that we wanted to do, but it had been a long time without food and we were incredibly hungry. So we snuck up on it. We're like, man, we just gotta get really close because this gun does not work very well at all. And he just has his pistol. We shot it and it kept running and we shot it again and finally spined it and then it fell over. So we ran over to it super quickly and we just basically cut the hide back and just cut a piece out of the shoulder and both just take a big bite. It was not that great. When you bite into this chunk of meat and the blood flowing down your chin and yeah, the nerves just getting stuck in your teeth so it feels like you have a mouthful of these bloody worms. Then it was just, you try to choke it down and then it just got in my head super fast. In this case, the risks of eating raw meat outweigh the benefits of satisfying hunger pangs. Uncooked game can carry bacteria and parasites that might make a person sick. I was just like made acutely aware of the smell and the taste and the blood and the nerves in your teeth that are like worms and it just, it was just culmination of all those things because I've cleaned countless animals. So that part's not a big deal, but it was just that trifecta of those immediate things that kind of really just culminated. I definitely threw up and I just all the river water that I had. I tried to force myself to eat it like three or four times. I just couldn't do it. It was really frustrating, actually. My friend is busy just carving away and having a feast. His stomach is a lot stronger than mine, I guess. We did skin out, uh, out the muskox, piled on as much meat as we could carry and just put it on two logs. And so we threw all that on there and litter carried it for as far as we could. If you're not a hunter, this might sound strange, but hunting across the U.S. is diligently regulated in order to manage wildlife resources. And in Alaska, they don't mess around. Rob and his friend were out hunting caribou, so they weren't permitted to hunt musk ox on this trip. Alaska Fish and Game does have a provision in their regulations that states you may kill wildlife for food to save your own life. But it also says, quote, you must salvage all meat and surrender what is left to the state after your rescue, end quote. Rob and his friend hoped they could deliver the meat to the proper authorities after they returned to the outfitters. We probably carried it for about four or five miles. The terrain is just really uneven. You're either walking in the sand, which really makes your legs tired after a while, or you're walking over large rocks that kind of just roll your ankles in those rubber boots, or you can be walking through fairly deep water that's just pulled around there. So the terrain really wasn't super easy to traverse. I'm not sure how much weight it was, but it was quite a bit. And plus we're pretty, haven't had any food in a while, pretty exhausted. We just kind of set up along the riverbank and there was a slight cut bank. So we laid out the muskox hide and then from our chest up was able to cover underneath of the cut bank and then just folded ourselves up like a taco inside of the muskox hide and then fell asleep. They dragged the muskox carcass a few hundred yards from where they'd be sleeping. They hoped if a bear came, it would be more interested in the ox meat than in them. 
With temperatures dropping, they felt they had no choice but to use the ox hide to shield themselves from the cold. And uh, later, I, I regained consciousness and thought it was pitch black and I couldn't hear anything and I felt like I couldn't move at all. And I was like, I don't think this is heaven, but I don't think I'm dead either. So I was just really disoriented and I was like, what on earth is going on? But I felt like I just couldn't move at all. And I was just like, are you awake? And he's like, what, what? And I was like, can you move at all? And he's like, no. And I was like, oh my gosh, I can hear him start to move. And, and so then we hear this really loud snap and we both pause and I was like, are you okay? And he's like, I think I'm fine. So we just both just start thrashing and then there starts to be more cracking and more cracking. And then it's super bright. And what had happened was it had actually like sleeted. And so we had just become like encased inside of this muskox hide. And if you've ever slept on a muskox hide, I swear it will rival any queen mattress ever. They are really soft to lay on. We've been sleeping on rocks and and bushes and whatever else the entire time prior to that. So yeah, it was like a cloud. I think we would have totally froze to death that night if we hadn't had that musk oxide, but we were super warm because it just provided insulation. With some effort, Rob and his friend broke out of their frozen cocoon. It wasn't like a, a massive amount of ice, but it was enough to like you wake up and you realize that last night you would have died if you hadn't had this musk oxide. Really big highs and lows that really bring you back to reality and realize just how fragile this whole situation is. At that point, we were awake, and so we figured we'd probably just keep heading. It was fairly light out. At that point, the hide was pretty much useless. It was just soaked on the bottom, and it weighed just a ton. And the rest of it was just solid ice, so it was really frustrating that we had to leave that behind, but it was just, it was pretty much useless for us at that point. The meat had, it started to turn, which I was really surprised on because the, it had gotten really cold that night but it was pretty warm the day before, like after we had shot it. I didn't trust myself to smell it because I just think that the smell would turn me off, but he felt that the meat was pretty disgusting at that point too. And so anyway, it was super frustrating to think that we had to leave that behind. So we started heading down more and more. We were just gonna get back to the shelter and just go from there. The fog was fairly thick, but we were like, we're just right on the river's edge trail. We know that our shelter's right next to it. The SOS is right next to that. But that being said, it just, yeah, we weren't really thinking very clearly. We really had not had much to eat at this time point. We just kept walking and walking and walking. And one of us would be like, you know, we should probably stop. And the other one's like, no, let's keep going. And then probably an hour later, we would swap and the one would say, yeah, you're right, we should stop. And the other one's like, no, you're right. We should probably keep going, just keep doing this. And we walked and we walked forever. And the fog was starting to lift. And I was like, man, I don't recognize any of this. And so we start looking around with the binoculars. And then we look back and we see the pump station behind us probably a half mile. We were both pretty agitated with each other, but it was just, it was what it was. So anyway, we now had our bearing. And so we walked back up to the outfitter's cabin and kind of sat across from that and spent the remainder of the day just sitting there and just trying to just figure out a solution, trying to just look and see what there were for logs or sticks or things like that to be able to use for a raft. On day five, Rob was lying on his back resting when his friend spotted a caribou and told him to shoot it. And so I lean over and I grab his pistol and I'm still laying on my back and I pull the trigger to shoot the caribou. He goes over there and I'm just trying to figure out, all right, I have to eat this thing. It has been way too long and God only knows when we're gonna eat again. I have got to figure out a way to eat this thing. I cut out thin strips, laid them on the rocks, just tried to make it into more of like a chip kind of a thing and just did it in really thin strands. So it was just basically like little shoestrings of it. And that worked well. I just started eating that. The taste was whatever. I've eaten tons of wild game, but I think the nerves between the teeth got me the first time. So I made sure that wasn't gonna be the case. We kind of shredded up the caribou. So anyway, just eating that little by little and we were very thankful for that. We were just kind of sitting there and we're like, man, we really need to figure out how to get out of here. It kind of gave us more clarity of thinking. And we're like, you know, we really need to try more with that binocular to try to see if we can start a fire. So we took a rock and smashed my nice binoculars to pieces, pulled out the lens of the inside and then tried to light it. And sure enough, we had smoke. It was just like the thinnest plume. And since then, I definitely have worked to practice my firecraft a little bit more to become more efficient at starting fires. But at that point, I really had not practiced much at all trying to start fires with more unconventional methods. 
He's like, well, let's try to use the gunpowder from one of the bullets to try to get it going. And I was like, okay. And so I was trying to dig this projectile out with my knife for, for at least five minutes. And he's like, no. And so he took the bullet and laid it on its side and then took the knife and then just started smashing it with a hammer. And I was like, that's going to blow up in our faces. But anyway, he, it didn't. And he made through it. I uh, got through the brass and then we just poured the gunpowder into the thing. And then, yeah, just we had fire and ignited and it was awesome. And then the wind blew it out. It was fine. It was slightly demoralizing, but then we had, luckily I was shooting at 375 Weatherby and it holds an awful lot of powder inside that casing. And so we were able to get a fire going. We were grilling caribou. We set up some sticks to like make a teepee shape for the caribou hide so it could dry out and maybe use it as a blanket. We were ecstatic. It was a really great point in life. <laughs> we put rocks up next to it and then kept the fire going and the rocks worked really well because you can lay them once the rocks are really warm you can put them up against your kidneys and then it kind of works as a radiator and makes your whole body a lot warmer and so that was incredibly helpful. We fell asleep and it did start to rain not a ton but enough to where it did rehydrate the caribou hide and so it was just slimy and just slid all over and it was not that great. But we kept that fire going. That was definitely the most crucial thing for us. And so the next morning we woke up and like, all right, we need to start a fire that literally just everyone can see. So we just rounded up every piece of driftwood that we could find everywhere, just started getting it together. And then we just started building this fire and we just tried to build it as big as we could. We went and got some wet grass from the riverbank and then just started doing like smoke signals, little cloud puff things. We were doing that and at, probably at the highest point, we had probably five or six cars stopped across the river from us and they were parked and they were looking at us through their binoculars and we were looking at them through our monocle now. We're just walking around the SOS, we're jumping up and down and we did this for probably 45 minutes. Anything to attract the most attention to us as we can possibly can. And over the course of an hour, they all drove away because our fire burned down to nothing. And that was pretty demoralizing because we didn't know what we were going to do at that point. We just put all of our bets on one thing and that thing didn't work out. That was the biggest mental game was they can see us and they still don't know that anything's wrong. And just having that day after day was, that was definitely a challenge mentally. The sun was starting to sink a little bit lower and we were trying to figure out what we were going to do from there on out because we we thought for sure that was going to be our best bet. We actually hear a plane fire up across the river and it's the outfitter and he had told us on day six that he was going to be flying out a new group of guys to go hunting and then he'd be picking us up the next day. We did at least start knowing that, hey, you know what, after day seven, they should start come looking for us, hopefully. Now, we were absolutely nowhere near where we were originally at so we thought that would probably take some time but we were hoping that at some point we would be found so we just sat there and we tried to get their his attention as he flew by and just didn't notice anything and so kind of just went back to sitting on the beach for a while and then and it's probably i don't know sometime later we the plane plane flew back by and i was ripped off my shirt swinging over my head trying to get their attention and at this point i was i almost didn't i almost just sat there but just yeah I just got to the point where it's just, just like, this doesn't do anything. And but anyway, then he tipped his wings to signal me or to wave or whatever. And I didn't wave back. Then I just put my arms in an X and just crossed my arms against my chest and just pointed at the ground and just ran around the SOS to attract attention to it. And then the plane went back and landed. And I was like, oh, gosh, man, because he has floats on. So I'm thinking in my head, he can just land literally on our side and make sure we're okay and then go about his day, but he just, for some reason, didn't see it the way I did. <laughs> anyway, so he flies back to his trailer and some time goes by and I'm just like, man, I just don't know what we're gonna do. And then probably an hour goes by and then the plane fires up again and it flies a half circle around us and then it drops something out of the plane right next to us. And so we race over to it and it says that the troopers have been notified. We're gonna be rescued, this is great. But it's starting to get fairly, it's getting darker outside, I should say, it never, I can't say as though it had ever got really fully dark. It did, we were probably asleep during that time, but it got, got pretty dark. But uh, they still may not start up until, what if they're out looking for somebody else? They don't have a lot of manning at those stations. I think they're like one or two troopers at each station. It's pretty minimally manned. And those are several hours away from this location. So we uh, 
We're just sitting there, and then all of a sudden, out of nowhere, this guy on a hovercraft just buzzes up right on the beach next to us. Hey, you guys need a ride? And we're like, yes. And all I could say was yes, because I just <laughs> really, brain fog was pretty aggressive at this point. And uh, hopped in the hovercraft with him, with all of our stuff, caribou and a gun. <laughs> made our way across. As we were going across the pond, there were already two planes that were circling right over our area. And so we got across, we were met by the troopers and uh, had a conversation with them. Then we were pretty good to go. Went back to the outfitter's cabin and probably 10 minutes later, we hear the plane land again. And he was actually awesome. He just, he flew right back out. Cause of course he GPS the way he had dropped us off at before. And he picked up our whole tent, all of our belongings, everything. And so we actually ended up with all of our gear, which was really awesome. We never found it again, but he did. So that was super cool. Went back down, drove all the way back to Anchorage. I met with my wife and she was very surprised because we got back perfectly in time, but I had lost 28 pounds. I'm not a very big person as it is. I'm six foot three. And at that point I weighed 183 pounds. And so I had lost 28 pounds from there. So it was pretty noticeable. I was pretty skinny, but I'm really glad actually that my wife didn't know at, during that entire ordeal because she was pregnant with our first son Remington. And so that was something that really tried to give me focus. I'm like, all right, I can, I will be a terrible person if I die out here and leave my wife with our newborn child. A lot of the stuff that I do now for a living and different things. I get a, a lot of opportunities to be able to help people out on a daily basis. And I don't know, I just could think that God maybe kept me alive, saved me for things like that so that I can just help others with things. It was, it was for a fact that God saved us. We would have totally been dead. Otherwise, there's no doubt about it in my mind. There's countless times where we could have never found the muskox or we could have never seen that pillar cloud thing, or we could have never, if the sun hadn't been clear enough and bright enough, maybe we wouldn't have seen that little silver speck of pump station too, or just a bunch of different things. I definitely have a lighter with me at all times. When, whenever I'm hunting, not, not in normal everyday life, I did get better at my firecraft quite a bit in general. The conclusion that I've come to from my firecraft is that you should just bring a lighter with you at all times. <laughs> And it's just a better situation. I have it in a Ziploc bag. And uh, I guess that's probably just really the biggest change that I've made. It's only recently, probably in the past year or two, that I've felt good about the idea of maybe going to try that trip again, just to be more prepared about it. It's just, it was, Alaska can just chew you up and spit you out pretty hard. This episode of Out Alive was produced and written by me, Louisa Albanese, along with writing and editing by Zoe Gates. Scoring and sound design was by Jason Patton. Thank you to Rob for sharing your story with us. Thanks to listening to Out Alive. And if you have a backcountry survival story and you're interested in sharing, you can email me at outalive at outsideinc.com. <laughs>